there was this school in this school where the teacher was teaching that God doesn't exist and her proof for God's non-existence was the fact that you can see God therefore he doesn't exist and so she simply said do you guys see a dashboard do you guys see the board you know the chalkboard everybody says yes we can see a chalkboard chalkboard exists then she pointed to her table she said do you guys see the table yes we see the table therefore the table exists and then she asked the third question she said do you guys see God everybody said no she said well we come to the conclusion God does not exist and Johnny sitting there he rose his hand and asked the teacher if he can ask a question of the class and the teacher says Johnny go ahead ask the question and the, the Johnny repeated a few questions she said do you guys see the teacher's chair they said yes we can see the teacher's chair the teacher's chairs exist then he asked next question she said do you guys see teacher's brain they said no we don't she says based on that conclusion we all come to the mutual agreement teacher doesn't have any brain <laughs> she said why should we listen to someone with our brain of course she's gonna say God doesn't exist because she has no brain and this little small Johnny just put the teacher in a very uncomfortable place now I highly discourage you to do that to your teachers if they will propose these kind of arguments but the argument that something is real because you can see it with your physical eyes is not fair can you see perfume you can't you know most of you can see music but you can hear music your eyes are limited God did not create every information to be available to every sense that he gave you God allows information to be sometimes received by one sense and completely not received by another and so your ears they depend on your eyes when it comes to seeing and your eyes they depend on your ears when it comes to hearing and your eyes your ears your touch depends on the nose when it comes to smelling so we all know that the reality of the physical world cannot be perceived by one sense exactly same thing is applied to spiritual world spiritual world is real spiritual world is as real as you are your thoughts are spiritual in the sense they cannot be detected by a microscope your motives cannot be detected by a machine there's no machine in the world that can detect your consciousness but we all know sitting here whether atheist agnostic or Christians we all come to the same conclusion we have thoughts we have a mind and we have a conscience and if you're sitting here today and you doubt that you have a mind or you doubt that you have thoughts or you doubt that you have a consciousness you need to see a psychiatrist because you have a problem typical person whether atheist or not atheist will come to the same conclusion that they have a mind they have thoughts and they have consciousness and all of these three things cannot be detected by not one machine in our tri-cities that means that these things are invisible therefore they are spiritual spiritual world is real spiritual world created a natural world spiritual world influences the natural world spiritual world is older than natural world and spiritual world overrules and overrides the natural world as christians we must get more acquainted as spiritual beings with the spiritual world as Christians we must also understand it is the will of God to show in our life in the supernatural ways. God wants to do things no man can explain. God wants to do things in our life no man can get a credit for but God. Today we live in the world, we live in a generation that is hungry for supernatural. Right before the service I scrolled through the movies in the local movie theater and three almost every weekend three to four movies in our movie theaters are all about zombies spirits haunted houses horror or some kind of a supernatural activity why are these movies produced why is walking dead such a popular tv show why is anything that has to do with paranormal activity that was made with few hundred thousand dollars and became a and just a huge sensation in our generation because our generation has an appetite for supernatural and many times that appetite is not satisfied within the church and the Hollywood sees that appetite and since they're only interested in making money they feed that appetite with things that actually harm people instead of help them God wants us as Christians us as church is to have a healthy desire for the supernatural and that supernatural desire for that supernatural is fully satisfied in the scriptures of God can somebody say amen the church is supernatural Jesus's ministry was supernatural one-third of his ministry he cast out demons 
He addressed the spirits and the darkness and the demons and the curses in people's lives. But after a while when the church became popular because of Constantine, Emperor Constantine, he made Christianity stop, persecution stop and he kind of made Christianity famous. And when Christianity became famous, Holy Spirit was no longer necessary to advance the cause of the good news. People relied on the Holy Spirit but he was no longer as needed as was before. And Holy Spirit whenever he is not needed, he draws away. And after a while we know what happened to the church, you know crusades and so many other bad things that happened for which the church still gets the rap from the world. Oh well look at you guys what you've done. But that's exactly what happens to a church when the church becomes drifts away from the things that are central in the Bible and the things that are central is God's power, God's spirit and God's presence. It's like the Chinese Christians that came to United States and upon leaving United States they asked them what is your opinion about the American Christians? Us. And they said we are so amazed and surprised and shocked with how much you guys can do in America without God. You know it's sad but it's sadly true. A lot of times if you remove the Holy Spirit from our lives or even from our church services nothing really would change. But if you remove the Holy Spirit from the Bible everything changes. If you remove the Holy Spirit from the people who live outside of United States or Western countries everything changes. I want to speak to you briefly today on the topic of curses. Very controversial topic but for us it has nothing to do with controversy. It has to do with helping people who are suffering and who are in need. As you heard David's testimony and you hear testimonies in our church, a lot of people who get freed from demons, people who get freed from curses. Most of you, you already know our church is known for that kind of things. Well, I believe the church of Jesus is supposed to be known for those kind of things. And though this topic is debated in many circles and many places, for us it's not a topic to debate. It's a topic to encourage people so people can find freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness in this place? There is few types of curses. The first one that's common one and that's the generational curse. A generational curse is when a curse gets passed on from one generation to another. A statistic says if your father was an alcoholic you have a 10 times higher likelihood of becoming an alcoholic. I remember reading a story this today actually about a correction officer who was working in a prison and he noticed he met this man who was in prison because he molested his own child. And after a few months of praying for this man, he finally led him to Jesus Christ and this man repented of his sins and he mentioned how his own father molested him. And he mentioned how his father was molested and, and this correction officer who was a Christian, he says, I can't believe such a disgusting thing that happened in this family. And he says, my idea that generational curses are not real, he said, it was shattered into pieces by meeting this family. Sometimes we bury our head in the sand and we pretend that reality doesn't exist. But the Bible says iniquity of the fathers get visited up to four generations. There is possible to be in a family where there is a curse and it passes on from one family to another. There is a story about two famous families and these families lived about a hundred years ago. One of them is Jonathan Edwards and the other one is uh, Max Jukes. And it's, it's a long story about how they got uh, circulated too. But I'll just read difference between their families. You can see on one, the guy who looks like a priest. He represents the Edwards and the other guy represents Jukes. Most of you heard this. I'm going to repeat it for you. 300 out of 1,200 of this guy's descendants. So one out of four, they were very, very poor. One out of four died in infancy from lack of good care and lack of good conditions. 50% of women, no 50 women, they lived in a very promiscuous like prostitution lifestyle. 400 men and women were physically wretched early by their own wickedness. Seven were murderers. 60 had, were habitual thieves who spent on average 12 years each in lawlessness. 130 were criminals who were convinced more than once of a crime. Now compare around the same time this man's family Jonathan Edwards, one of them was, was a U.S. Vice President. Three of them were U.S. Senators. Three of them were Governors. Three of them were Mayors. Thirteen were College Presidents. Thirty were Judges. Sixty-five were Professors. 
80 held public office service, 100 were lawyers, 100 were missionaries, pastors and theologians. Definitely in this family and in this family there were a few people who were doing good but the most of the family had really bad and the other one most of the family was doing really good. Generational curses are real we see that in the Bible like David's family and then we see the Saul's family where it seems like a crooked tree and the other we see where somewhat established tree where people follow God's path and God's will and God wants to break generational curses and release generational blessings upon our life. Can I get a witness in this place? The second curse that is predominant is called a caste curse. A caste curse is when somebody pronounces a curse on you when you did them harm. The scripture says curses without a cause don't stick. Meaning if somebody curses you, if somebody hires a witch to pronounce a spell on you but you did no harm to that person, those curses they will never stick. But if the curses are pronounced on you and you caused somebody pain, those curses will stick. If you're not a follower of Jesus and there is no protection on your life of the blood of Jesus then those curses stick. It's important to understand that cast curses affect people who are casting them as well as those directed to. Cast curses don't just work for those who receive them, it's also for those who send them. I remember hearing a story of a young man who uh, wanted to punish a girl because she didn't like him. He liked the girl and she didn't like him back. So he went to a witch doctor. Now it's not dominant today where people go to witch doctors if they want to get at somebody. We do a lot of other nastier things today. But in those days people would go to a witch doctor. He went to a witch doctor and he said, I want to cast a spell on her. Meaning I want to destroy her life. The witch doctor of course asked for some money. He gave her some money and then she created a lock and she says, I want you to pronounce all the nasty things you want to happen in this girl's life. So he, he go ahead, just open up his mouth and just let it, let it out. Said all that I want her to do da, 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 this bad. I want her to be sick. I want her to, to die. I want her to have this and that. He said that and the witch locked the lock and threw the lock in the river and the key somewhat else. And exactly everything this man pronounced became real in this girl's life. Until a few years later, everything he pronounced on her life started to happen in his. He came to church asking God to change his life. And the prophecy was spoken to him saying, there is a lock and that lock is the cause of all of your problems. He says, which lock? And the prophet revealed, he says, a lock where you destroyed someone's destiny, you cursed somebody and that curse is now working against you as well. The Bible says to us as Christians, don't curse your enemies, bless them. Because everything you send their way is coming back at you. Some of you saw the video, take a look at this uh, video. Uh, you most of you saw this, it's karma at its best. Um, Pray for her. It's like curses. You release it and it comes back right at your face. You hit somebody or you want to destroy the milk or you want to steal something and you run, you hit something else. You want to hit the horse, well the horse gets you back. You want to hit some elderly people or this what happens. You want to hit that innocent animal? You want to hit a sign? Well the sign hits you back. That's exactly how received curse, curses, cast curses work. Anytime you feel obligated or somebody hurts you, somebody causes you harm and you say, you know what? I wish they'll drop dead. I wish somebody will do worse to them. I wish they break up. I wish they will be sick. Remember, you're sending a ball at the wall. It will hit them. It will hit you back. You can't throw mud in somebody's face without getting your hands dirty. Cast curses work all the time but they many times they backfire on the people sending them not just the people receiving them. A third type of curse is a earned curse. It's a curse that we draw upon our life by indulging in rebellious ways against God. The first time curse was mentioned in the Bible was when Adam rebelled against God. It's interesting when Adam disobeyed God, God didn't threaten him with hell. 
a curse came upon the earth a curse came upon their family and as a result we see two children no one else in the world and one child kills another one that's a disaster that's a curse on the family we see Adam being kicked out of paradise because of the curse nowhere in the old testament we see God promising take people to heaven if they obey him but God says if you obey me I give you a blessing if you rebel against me God didn't say I'm going to send you to hell in the old testament he says hell is going to be unleashed in the form of a curse curses are real and when we step on the territory of sin guys what we do is we draw like a magnet a curse into our life and it begins to work and it begins to destroy our life I remember hearing a story of a man who really wanted to get married but either he was not good looking or didn't have a personality but he just didn't have a luck and he had this particular girl he was so fascinated by but she just wouldn't even give him a time of the day and so he decided to go and use spiritual means to manipulate her and so he went to some lady who used a charm on him and she told him if you take this soap and you bathe yourself and then you go where she is she will like you he paid for soap and it was a charm it was a spiritual manipulation it was demonic so he took that soap washed himself in that soap and he went in and the girl out of nowhere started to like him he said man this works went and got more soap until he proposed to that girl kept washing himself in this charm of soap to keep getting this girl and eventually they got married after a few months of marriage the soap stopped working and the girl realized she married the craziest guy on this planet and what she did is she first burned his clothes then she burned his house and then she wanted to burn him and that's when he brought this crazy girl to church saying she is crazy as prayer was being offered for them the pastor of the church who God uses supernaturally he looks at him and he says the problem is not the crazy girl he says you're the crazy guy he says you went to the devil to get her and you used manipulation through witchcraft and through spells to get her and now what happened is you got her the devil's ways and the devil gave you one thing but with another hand he took what your life depends on he says you're the one that needs deliverance not her and after he prayed for her and he prayed for him they received deliverance and God restored their marriage and they still stayed together and God gave them a second chance you can't go to the devil for help and expect not to get a curse with it when we step on the Satan's territory we draw a curse into our life when we walk with God we draw a blessing into our life can somebody say amen? amen the second part of this message I want to speak to you about how to overcome those curses if you have a Bible let's go together with me to Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 and verse 14 if you do not have a Bible you can look at the screen and I will read Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become cursed for us for it is written cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith I want you to see the amazing part Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law the law is ten commandments we know the law is not cursed the law is good but when you break the law it brings curse and the Bible says in here that Jesus came to redeem us from the consequences of breaking the law which is curse and Jesus became curse for us so not only Jesus took our curse on the cross but he became curse for us and the Bible explains how cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree today a cross is a symbol of Christianity then cross was a symbol of a curse today cross is a beautiful jewelry then cross was a curse place it was a symbol of a curse and Jesus died on the cross to remove the curse not just to free me from my sin but to deliver me from the consequences of my sin and break the power of curse over our life can somebody say amen, amen. and not only that but it says in here that the blessing of Abraham might come on those who are Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit so we see here how we overcome the curse in our lives operating in our lives number one is that we have to see ourselves 
as Abraham's children. The cross connects us to Abraham's family. The cross disconnects us from the curses of our family. Abraham was a good man and Abraham was a very blessed man. You know we thank God for our families but how many of you secretly, don't raise your hand, you would wish to switch your family <laughs> just for a week, a month, a year, a decade, a lifetime please. <laughs> don't raise your hand because you, your parents are here, your siblings are here but but we all, some of you are like I don't care <laughs> pastor I want it now. I think God secretly knew that our families are good and we love our families, we appreciate our families but, but we all know that it would have been awesome to be born in a, in a different family and God gives us a chance to be in our physical family with our physical family to switch spiritually to a better family. To belong to a family and God gives us this family, family of Abraham. Where Abraham becomes your spiritual father. Will you begin to accept and anticipate the blessings of Abraham to roll on your life, generational blessings on your life through Jesus Christ. To overcome curses you have to mentally see yourself as a child of Abraham. Abraham had a name first, his name was Abram. Abram means glorious father. That's sufficient and enough to have one child, few children. But God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you so much stuff. I'm going to give you health. I'm going to give you this and that. And Abraham, I'm going to change your name. God, why do you want to change my name? See, long after you're going to be dead, I'm going to send my Jesus. He's going to die on the cross. There's going to be so many families, Latino families, Russian families, American families, black families, brown families all kinds of families and they all gonna live in their life because of their past sins in curses and I want them to benefit and to be getting generational blessing from you so I'm gonna change your name to a father of many nations that when in Jesus Christ they will be your children the blessing on your life is gonna go on their life Abraham the blessing on your life will not only go to the Jews because you're a father of many nations. Russian nations, American nation, Canadian nation, African nation, all kinds of nations who will believe in Jesus Christ. That blessing will go on them as well. Mentally when you see your life and maybe it's under a curse. The first step is you have to mentally see yourself. Spiritually I have already a blessing and my father is Abraham. Can somebody say amen? amen. The signs of a curse are following. Is there chronic disease, phobias and fears, premature deaths, loneliness and divorce, poverty and lack, repeated disasters. These are signs of curses. They are described in the Bible in book of Deuteronomy where God describes when curses come what happens and this is kind of what happens when we live a life of curse. We have chronic constant diseases. We have phobias and fears, anxiety, mental disorders and mental breakdowns, premature deaths, constant loneliness and divorce, poverty and lack and repeated accidents and disasters. That's what happens when we live a life under a curse. But when we mentally begin to switch and we say, we are with Abraham. Well, Abraham was healthy. So healthy that fathered children at the age of 100. And when his wife passed to glory, he kept on having children. He remarried. And not only Abraham, but Sarah, because she was under blessing at the age of 90. She was so good looking without a plastic surgery, without makeup without lotions that kings were killing for her. All the ladies, you're a daughter of Sarah. There is no greater blessing, no better plastic surgeon than the blessing of Abraham and a blessing of Sarah. Blessing of Abraham means you are going to be strong physically. That doesn't mean you will never have a flu day or week but that means because of that spiritually you accept that I am going to be healthy. That's why we work out. That's why we eat healthy. 
that's why we stay away from bad foods that's why we don't take anything wrong into our body like alcohol and drugs that's why we don't tattoo our bodies you may say is it wrong see I got this nice car and the moment I got it it's an Audi and it had uh, stickers on the bottom Audis Audi sign stickers the first thing I did with that car is I ripped those stickers off and washed it off because I would always put stickers on my Camry but when you get an Audi you don't want stickers on it let the car shine for itself it has enough beauty and glory in itself a lot of Christians they put stickers on themselves listen you are a temple of the Holy Spirit let you shine you're already beautiful enough and if you're not you got Abraham keep walking in that blessing let the glory of God shine through you watch your body receive the blessing of Abraham your body is going to be strong your body is going to be beautiful and your body is going to be blessed by God somebody say amen blessing of Abraham is not only you're going to have a health but you're going to have faith. Abraham was known to be a healthy man and he had faith and dreams not nightmares. He lived a long life. He was married. He was happy. He was in abundance and generosity. We know Abraham to be a wealthy man and God wants you to be a person who receives Abrahamic blessing. It means God wants you to live like Abraham. God bless your father. God bless your mother but spiritually you your father your mother your grandparents we all can come under a different line of the blessing of Abraham we can live financially different we don't have to live from poverty and lack that's where you may be in a reality but today the revelation of God says that Abraham is your standard and we spiritually connect to that I remember talking to a wonderful young man who just gotten saved in our ministry. He OD'd before and he was pronounced dead one time at the, ac at, at the accident scene. You know this man never had money, only bills and court, court dates, restraining orders, not restraining orders, all kinds of um, you know orders to, uh, to show up to court and everything. And he was telling me today, he said, Vlad, you won't believe it. He says, I am completely debt free. He said, this week all of my debts are paid. He said before I was so scared to receive any letter from the court and he said recently I got another letter from the court on my previous mail on my previous place where I lived and when I called that place and I asked them please open that letter because he said the only letters I got from the court was bills or you have to come to court and so I was expecting another one when they opened the letter and he says you won't believe it lad in that letter was a refund he said who gets a refund from court he says, God changed my life so much, I get refunds from the same places I used to go and pay stuff. See, that's what happens when God's blessing, blessing of Abraham begins to kick into your life. Your life begins to change. Yes, it might not happen overnight. I'm not saying you're going to be a millionaire. But what's going to happen is that you begin to slowly come out of debt. You begin to come out from financial bad decisions and God begins to give you enough and more than enough and you begin to be a blessing to your generation. Somebody say amen. You know one of the mentors the people that I follow and listen to you know this pastor at one time 15 years ago he was able only to give a hundred dollars to God a month because his income was so small but he kept dreaming that God one day I'll be able to give thousands I heard his latest testimony and he said today I no longer work at the church I don't receive salary from the church yet every month I give back to the church twenty thousand dollars and that's not in America it's in the countries outside of America and as of this month he was able to give with his wife 60 cars to people I was like man I wish I would be in his church <laughs> that's bl Abrahamic blessing when God blesses you enough that you're able to give when God blesses you enough that you're able to bless other people and walk out from financial source if you're in financial problems today remember God says through the cross you can be connected to Abraham you can have Abraham as your daddy can somebody say amen how do I apply that say to yourself constantly I'm not cursed I'm blessed look at yourself in the mirror when you have bills and overdue bills and maybe collections losing your home or maybe reality is going down make sure in your mind you don't go down with your reality in your mind you will say Vlad but what difference does it make it makes a big difference because your reality can always change make sure your mental attitude stays anchored on the cross the curse was redeemed from and I am blessed with Abraham the Bible says let the redeem of the Lord say so when you're redeemed from the curse you gotta say so 
You can't wait for your bills to change. You can't wait for your health to change. You can't wait for you to get married and somebody to treat you well before you look at yourself and you tell yourself, I am redeemed from the curse of the law. Not because I feel so. Not because the bills say so. Not because the doctor's report say so. It's because God says so. And God's word is higher than the reality. God's word created the reality. It can change it. Can somebody say amen? Say to yourself every day, when you don't feel blessed, say to yourself, I am blessed. These are not empty words. You're not just positively speaking. There is a blood and the cross 2,000 years ago that is backing you up. You're not just something you thought in your head and you're just trying to keep yourself happy because you read book secret. No, it's because you read book called the Bible and the Bible says in the cross you will redeem from the curse of the law and you're blessed with Abraham. Tell yourself all the time. I am a blessed man. God is on my side. Can somebody say amen? The second aspect of it is victory on the cross doesn't end the war. It starts it. Victory on the cross does not end the war. It starts it. Which means that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid for everything 100%. But that victory doesn't end the war for you. It actually begins a war for you and let me explain when David was facing Goliath and Goliath was big and buff and the Bible says that David came against Goliath and he threw a stone in his head and Goliath fell when Goliath fell the war wasn't over actually war just begun the only difference is by falling of the Goliath in the heart of every Israelite exploded faith and a roar arose inside of them before they were hiding but now they are victors because Goliath fell and because Goliath fell a war that broke out was the war where they ran at their enemy with the victory inside already before they had defeat in their mind they were running from the enemy but now their champion David defeated the champion of the enemy and they ran at the enemy and they defeated them the difference between you and the world you don't fight for victory you fight from victory your victory has already been won on the cross but when Jesus wins a victory over a curse for you on the cross that means that inside of you rises up a shout inside of you rises up anger inside of you rises up a fight that says this is illegal in my life and I will not allow it or permit it to live and thrive in my life and you go and fight it not as a victim trying to get a victory but as a victor trying to secure a victory for the glory of God amen sometimes people come for prayer line and they get delivered from a demon and everything is good but God wants to teach you not just how to get free God wants you to teach you how to fight sometimes you get healed and the sickness is gone and then a few days later symptoms reappear and people throw up their hands in the air and say oh I'm sick again God is not just trying to get you healed God is also trying to teach you how to be a fighter sometimes you get lonely and you get freed from that loneliness and that depression and everything is good until you had that low time and those emotions they surface again and this is the moment that you have to not throw up your hands in the air and says oh I'm so helpless I'm just gonna sleep in my bed all night and all day and just watch Netflix and cry myself to sleep you gotta rise up and be a warrior and fight not for victory but from victory already purchased on the cross of Jesus Christ amen the Bible says in Christ we are more than conquerors more than conquerors how can you be a more than a conqueror see in the world you're a conqueror when you win the battle in God's kingdom you win the battle in Christ so you can be a conqueror we get victory before we fight and that's why we fight when the devil uses our emotions when the devil uses our thoughts against us and this is usually where the battle happens you get free God delivers you from drugs or maybe you stopped a bad relationship 
or you finally decide to commit your life and you decide to come to morning prayers or you decide to you know what I'm gonna begin to tithe I'm gonna begin to live according to God's Word and everything seems to be good for first few weeks or first few months and then the feelings begin to rage against you your emotions come in and those emotions are clouded with rejection fear you just don't feel like doing it apathy laziness for some people it's depression begins to crawl back in for others it's the craving to smoke again for some it's the craving to look at pornography or to inhale in that drugs people begin to invite you to the same concerts and nightclubs that you used to go to and that thing begins to come back those feelings those thoughts begin to come back and this is the time where the devil tells you you're not really free especially when the person stumbles or falls and the devil begins to come and flood you with the thoughts of guilt and shame and says listen you're never gonna change this whole thing that people are getting changed that's for special people and you're not those special people this is the moment you have to rise up and not tell yourself but tell that wicked devil so listen devil you got a wrong person you cannot speak like this to me and you gotta tell the devil listen Satan get behind me I may feel down but I am seated in the heavenly places with Christ I may feel depressed but I am blessed with God the first thing that I told you is tell yourself I am blessed but the second thing is you have to tell the devil to shut up you have to tell those feelings the devil is using against you that guilt and that shame that fear and that loneliness that depression and that disappointment you have to look at that even if you don't feel it your feelings don't matter what matters is your fighting spirit and Satan can smell a fighting spirit 2,000 miles away when you rise up and tears are rolling down your eyes but you got that stone in a slingshot and you say devil you come against me with fear you come against me with loneliness you're big and tough and you've been talking for 40 days but listen I am small but my God is big and I'm gonna throw this rock rock at your head and you rise up and you shake off that shame and you shake off that guilt and you shake off that depression no matter how you feel what matters is how you fight because God is on the other side and watching his little warrior God's angels are watching you're never left alone it's the God wants to produce within you not a wussy or a whining spirit but a warrior spirit you're made in the image and likeness of God God never lost the battle and he was never afraid of one Lions give birth to lions, eagles give birth to eagles and God created you and inside of you He placed a fighting spirit and He wants that to grow inside of you but it will never grow inside of you until you're thrown into a place where your emotions are raging, your thoughts are screaming and you feel like the world, the weight of the world is on your shoulder. In that moment don't just cry out to God and say God help me, open up your mouth and tell that wicked devil to go where he came from. Jesus said when you face the mountain he didn't say pray about it he didn't say cry about it he didn't say call all your friends and post it on Facebook and take a picture of it he didn't say whine about it he says open your mouth and speak to it when you always speak about it but you never speak to it you're not gonna change it speak to your emotions speak to your thoughts speak to your circumstances learn to speak to your situation you're not going to change your curse over your life if you zip your lip and you wait the devil to bombard you with thoughts and keep filling your mind with his voice. It's about time you lift your voice. Amen. When I think of this and this is personal to me because like you I was freed from certain things and like you and I, I had those things come back and at times I felt like I lost my freedom. I've ministered to so many people who have this problem who got freed and then they fell once and the devil lied to them saying you're the same person you've never changed and you will never change and my goal was to encourage them stop listening to the devil get your sword and stab him stab those lies get rid of them out of your head you're a warrior not a wimp there's a movie that always helps me 
there's one clip of that movie and I'm going to show it to you it, it's 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 a very cheesy movie to some of you and it's written by C.S. Lewis it's a clip from Narnia but you will get the spiritual point I want you to see that right now your emotions are like a beautiful pet on a good day they're so friendly your emotions are so cute they're so nice they make you so happy your thoughts they, they send you good vibes but the moment Satan comes in your emotions turn into wolves they raid at you they want to eat you up they want to destroy you they want to put you literally in an emotional grave and in that moment you got to do what this guy did Susan <laughs> Come on! We've already been through this before. We both know you haven't got it in you. Watch out! That's you, right there. And that's your emotions on the bad day. And that's Jesus doing the, doing the prayer line. Stay your weapons. This is Peter. But he always leaves you one to do it on your own. You may think you're a king, but you're going to die. Like a dog! Ah! Okay, stop crying. He didn't get hurt. This is when the first time you overcome your own battle. After him. He'll lead you to Edmund. Peter, clean your sword. Rise, Sir Peter Wolfsbane, Knight of Narnia. Forgive me. But when I hear about defeating the devil, that's the only thing that I think about. I sometimes feel exactly like that guy. The pet that was okay and then turns into a lion or turns into a wolf that begins to attack me. And you begin to feel like there's few more moments and then you're alone. And God is there. It seems like he's not helping. Why is he not helping? Because Jesus didn't only come to free you. He also came to empower you. And you will never know what you have until you have to use what you have until you have to stand on God's word until you have to fight those bad feelings that Satan sends until you the circumstances come and you feel alone maybe you feel like just like that and I know this is a a movie and it's a fabrication of a man's imagination C.S. Lewis but it points a beautiful picture that Jesus is, doesn't just want you to go 25 times to a prayer line go to prayer line that is great there are certain victories you get at prayer lines but my friend there are certain victories God gives you his power he gives you a power in your mouth he gives you his word and he says rise up you're my knight you are my soldier fight it overcome it and you will have victory in your life and you will have a new life in Jesus mighty name because somebody say amen and somebody say amen God is going to give you victory over your life every curse is going to be broken but you have to change your confession I am blessed you have to change your confession no longer just describe your problem attack your problem with your words attack that feelings begin to say for them to take the rightful place in Jesus mighty name